I think that punk rock invented cancel culture. When we signed to a major label back then, <laughs> it's like we were outcasts. We were, you know, we were criminals. You know, like the the biggest, like you could call me an asshole. You could call me a, a jerk. You can call me a motherfucker. You can call me all these things. But the worst thing that you could call someone back then was a rock star. My name is Billy Joe Armstrong, and these are my words and music. An audible original. My first concert was Van Halen in 1984. And I was 12 years old and just how huge that was for me. And I remember just going to see that show and being so excited. And my cousin took me and my brother. And um, so we, me and my brother just got, went and got lost inside this arena. It was at the Cow Palace. And um, this sounds really funny, but I was so little and I was in the crowd. And then all of a sudden when Van Halen started playing, I'm looking up and I'm going, holy shit, that's my fucking hero right now. And like these tears started coming out of my eyes. And then I remember there was, I was surrounded by like women. So I had like boobs that were hitting my head because I was so little and my feet came off of the ground and I started having like a panic attack. And I remember crawling my way out of there and then going off to the side of these little rafters that I can sit in and watch the whole concert from there and just being like, God, I just had this, uh, this feeling of like, I can't believe that I just saw my heroes and this perfect thing that happened to me. I was born in Richmond, California, and uh, my mother was from Oklahoma. So my name, I'm not a William Joseph, I'm Billy Joe Armstrong. It's on my birth certificate. So it's uh, spelt with an IE because that's sort of the Oklahoma way, I think. So it's very oaky. But my mom, she comes from just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she came here, I think, in like 1943 or something like that to work in the shipyards. You know, my mom's one of 12 kids and I'm one of six. So it's just like a massive family. I remember my mother listening to Hank Williams and Dolly Parton. And she played a lot of country music in the radio. So I'm the, the youngest of six and my... My oldest brother, who was born in 1950, he he played a lot of, it was the Beatles and the Kinks and the Guess Who and uh, the Who. <laughs> and then like my sister, my oldest sister Marcy was born in 63. So she listened to Kiss and Journey. My sister Holly listened to she sort of hung out with a, a lot of uh, Mexican kids that were in the neighborhood. And so these kids would always listen to like, you know, stuff like um, like 50s music to like uh, Prince. And then my sister Anna, after that, she listened to a lot of like Fleetwood Mac. And there were some things that I liked, but my first feeling of ever having a guilty pleasure, I think was Fleetwood Mac. And I don't know why, but there was something very um, earth tones about it that I could never really put my 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 mind on. It's interesting too. It's like I have a reaction to music. Like when I hear something, to me, it's like it sounds ugly or it tastes bad or something like that. The first time I ever heard um, "Smoke on the Water." I remember, because that's supposed to be the quintessential song that every rock person is ever supposed to, that if you're a guitar player, you have to have, you know. And I remember hearing it for the first time and I was like, that sounds ugly. Like, that doesn't sound right to me. I, I don't know what it was about it, but um, so, you know, I moved on to Chuck Berry or something. <laughs> and then um, 
my older, my brother, he listened to a lot of like Led Zeppelin and, you know, Def Leppard and a little bit of Rolling Stones. So it was all over the place. And my father was a jazz drummer. So I remember hearing in the radio, hearing jazz. So I, I had a lot of, uh, there was a, a lot of music going on in my house. My father was a Safeway truck driver and he was in the union. He was a teamster. At the time they were able to, with you know five kids living at home, they could afford to buy a house in, in a small suburb. And right now in California, that is totally impossible, absolutely impossible. So when my dad was diagnosed, I remember it was at the end of the fourth grade. And then it, three months, it just like devastated him. Um, So he was, I think he was diagnosed in like June and he died in September. After he died, we, you know, we, all the kids were taken out of school, me and my brothers and sisters. And I remember that week that it was happening. And like, I think in my mind, I was thinking like, I'm going to go back to school and be that kid. I'm going to go back to school and be the kid with the dead parent or something like that. And I'm going to be the only person in school with the, you know, there are some kids that, you know, definitely had broken homes, but this was... I felt like it was different. Like there was like a something missing, you know, obviously. And I remember going back to school and seeing like when kids were looking at me, it was almost like I had a ghost over my shoulder or something. It felt, it it was just a really kind of ominous feeling that I had. And it was almost like my life started at zero again, if that makes any sense. But yeah, I just started, and I was always the kid. I kind of went through the rest of my school years with like that feeling, like I always had that stigma of like a dead parent or something. So when my dad died, you know, my mom ended up with a pension because my dad was in the Air Force. She she had to work the graveyard shift. My mother was a waitress in a 24-hour place called Rod's Hickory Pit. You know, I remember I used to sit with her at the at the dinner table and we would just count her tips, just like with nickels and quarters and dimes and pennies and stick them in those little paper kind of cylinders so she can just bring them in and get like turn it over into cash or something. I met Mike Durnt in the fifth grade. Mike met my father one time, and I think my father died probably two weeks later. So I had just met Mike, you know, it was 1982. One of my first uh, conversations that I ever had with Mike was about music. I think it was the first thing we ever talked about. I think we talked about Ozzy a little bit. And then I brought him home because I was like, hey, this guy's got an interest in music. And basically we were in the same class and we were both kind of competing to be class clown. So we just kind of started, you know, goofing around. I remember he had like this, you know, those little troll dolls. He kept one in his pocket all the time. He wanted to be um, a stand-up comedian. Even at a young age, like back when we were that young, he had a routine. He had all these jokes. He got in a lot of fights. He pissed a lot of people off. Um, and I just immediately liked him from, you know, so it was, uh, we, uh, we've we been friends ever since, you know, 10 years old. Me and Mike were 13 and we started a band. We called it Truant because Mike could play a little bit and I could play a little bit more a bit. And um, so we we sat around and we we learned Photograph by Def Leppard. Um, Ain't Talking About Love by Van Halen and uh, Crazy Train by Ozzy. I can remember it vividly. We were, I was sitting, we had twin beds and I was sitting on one bed and he was sitting on the other side and we were just sitting here strumming along and and playing these songs. And uh, we got this kid that was a neighborhood drummer and um, and, uh, my brother David was also a drummer. So by that time... 
we had already started getting into uh, like punk rock music and uh, just our taste just started changing. And I think, you know, with a lot of hard rock and heavy metal, right when it started going into the world of the power ballad, um, we were looking for something more raw. And uh, I felt like when the first time I ever saw like punk bands playing at 924 Gilman Street, I think in my mind, I thought of it being like the first time people ever saw rock and roll or something. It was in its rawest form and uh, is like everyone, no one was a professional. And that's what I loved about it is like, it was just like, you didn't have to be a guitar God. You didn't have to be uh, a great singer. It was all heart and fun. And uh, I had um, these infatuations with different girls at the time that were, uh, I don't, you know, it's, it's interesting is I, one time I serenaded this girl and it was one of the most awkward experiences I've ever, and I don't know what, I don't know, I don't know where I, I summoned the courage to do this, but so I serenaded this girl and I played the song A Thousand Hours. And I remember her father looking around the corner and, and like smiling and <laughs> I was just mortified, but I was really proud of being like a love song writer. I mean, all those songs back then were all love songs, but they were just like the feelings that I had. There were these, it was real interactions with real people and uh, the way that I felt about them. And uh, there was just like a real longing to uh, to be good to somebody. You know, that's the one thing about all those love songs back then is how I wanted to be a good, like, boyfriend or something. If you notice those songs, none of them, there's nothing about any of those songs that are, like, mean or mean-spirited or anything like that. It's all sort of longing and, you know, not just about love, but also about friendship, too. I always felt like I was kind of stupid or, you know, this like lack of education, you know, very lower working class kind of family. And I think that life can be really intimidating. You can feel really small in it. I think what it, I, I ended up kind of, I, I'm able to sort of do things like sum things up. I can, I can take in information and be able to sort of come up with some kind of metaphor or, or something or find some kind of philosophy behind it. When I dropped out, I was two years behind everybody else. And it was just impossible. I was at night school. I had to come to school extra early. So I had like a an eight period day and just trying to play catch up. And then finally, I just was like, screw it. I, you know, I'm not going to graduate anyway. So I smoked so much weed in high school. And I think like the last day of my junior year, I discovered cutting class. I don't know why I decided to cut class on the last day of school in the 11th grade, but the following year I cut class every day, every, almost every class. And when I dropped out of school, you know, you have to go around, you have your card that you have everybody fill out for you. All of the teachers had to kind of sign off that you weren't going to be in the class. I come into the classroom and I give them the, the sign out sheet and the teacher looked up at me and says, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I, uh, I was supposed, I never showed up at your class. And he's, he looked at me and in disgust and shook his head and signed me out. The hardest thing to do in the world when you're first starting out as a band is trying to get a gig, especially when you're 15, 16 years old, because you can't get in any of the clubs. You can't get anywhere unless you have a demo tape or you have this and that. And then, so I just asked my mom if, you know, there's a big sort of banquet room in the back of the restaurant. I said, do you think that we could play back there? And she said, yeah, for sure. So we uh, invited some friends and family to come see us play and, um, they brought in a little like hot dog truck so kids could get hot dogs. And, um, and then we played like for 40 minutes or something like that. And it was, um, it was an amazing feeling to feel like you're like, I'm like 
performing your own songs in front of your friends and uh and your it was uh you know the beginning of what was going to become the rest of your life we were a four piece at the time and we wanted to be like the replacements mike played guitar and then we had this friend that was our bass player at the time this guy sean hughes and we we're practicing at his house and I remember he had to go to the dentist and he said, go ahead and jam here. If you want, I'm going to go to the dentist. I think he had to get like a tooth pulled or something. And so I remember like, I said, Hey Mike, why don't you pick up the bass and let's give it a, a try. And Mike just blasted through all the bass parts perfectly note for note doing things that like the other guy just could not do. And then we stopped playing and then, and, and he, Mike had that look in his face. I remember we go, well, it looks like we're a three piece. And I said, well, instead of the replacements, maybe we could be Husker Du like that. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was pretty funny. My oldest brother, Alan, when Mike told him, he's like, yeah, I think I'm not going to play guitar. I'm going to play bass. And my brother, Alan told him, he goes, well, now you get to be lead bass player. And I think that always stuck with Mike that's sort of the way that he plays is like he he plays like he's uh almost like a doo-wop singer or something like playing the singing the low the low bass notes or something but he has these incredible runs that he can do a friend of ours had this kid his name is his name is robert but he went by the name of eggplant still does and um he had a backyard party in um I think 1988 and he asked us if we wanted to play. So we're like, Oh, Holy shit. We, you know, eggplant's going to have a backyard party and we're going to play. It's going to be great. So he had a bunch of, a bunch of bands that were playing and then, he, and no one had heard of us at all. Like it was basically kind of our first show really um, in front of people. We, we had no idea who they were. They were actually like uh, real kind of East Bay punk rockers that were there. And I remember we played with the, this kid that was our that was just kind of sitting in, filling in at the time. His kid, his name was Raj Punjabi. So me and Mike were we're just really drummerless. We didn't really know what we were doing. John Kiffmeyer was in a band called Isocracy. He was our original drummer for uh, Sweet Children and and Green Day. They were sort of the Gilman band like they were uh, this amazing band you would go see and and it was just like this whirling dervish of punk and art and craziness they would throw garbage throughout the whole room they would empty a dumpster inside the like it, they, it was the fun some of the funnest shows I've ever been to so John's band was there but their band their band were breaking up and I was out front and I was, uh, I was with a girl, this girl who's a friend of mine and we were hanging out, kissing a little bit and stuff like that. And then John came up to me and he hits me on the arm and he says, he goes, Hey, I, I hear that you guys are looking for a drummer. I just saw you guys play. And, uh, he's like, well, my band's breaking up. So, you know, uh, I'd like to, to, to be in your band. So he was like a seasoned punk guy. He had all these like, uh, people that he knew, like connections, I guess you would call it. But he, uh, also knew the people over at Lookout Records. Um, so we got to know everybody that it was almost like the things that were, that we had struggled for so, for like a couple of years to try to get a gig, try to get someone to listen to us, you know, like, hopefully put out a demo hope you know all these hopes and and dreams that we had and suddenly everything just started falling into place immediately after he joined the band i think john was in the band for 2 years so 88 89 and 90 he he left the band uh at the end of the summer in 1990 he didn't tell me I heard about it through this girl that he was leaving to go to college. And I was devastated. I, I thought like the last two years of my life have been the greatest years of my life. And then now 
it's over. I thought, I thought we were done for, you know, and then he, and then John mentioned, uh, we knew, we knew Trey from playing gigs with the Lookouts, the band that he was in. They were from up in, in uh, uh, Mendocino County. So John knew Trey pretty well. And John said, hey, I talked to Trey Cool. He's moving down to the Bay Area, you know, because he wants to get out of living in, in Mendocino. And so Trey, we tried it. And uh, we didn't really know him hardly at all. And we got into a room with him and started rehearsing with him. I have a big connection with drummers, um, whether it's Trey or whether it's David from um, Prima Donna that was in the long shot or, you know, especially Trey, because Trey has a very similar sense of humor that like my, my father had and, uh, but also had that, like a very bombastic drumming style. Um, so yeah, I think I always feel like that connection when I hear like a great drummer or, or, or something that just, you know, it makes me think of my father playing music with him. Well, immediately Trey, I mean, Trey was like, we were like, oh my God, this kid is a beast of a drummer. And he was only 17 years old. He's got a big personality. He has so much character about him, like saying these things that were just like, just the gnarliest sense of humor. He would say the craziest things to people, people that were our friends, you know, that we were all kind of mellow with. A lot of our friends were like, who the fuck is this dude? You know, he was just this 17 year old feral child that grew up on a mountain. I remember we played this show with Trey in, um, gosh, where were we at? We were in San Francisco. And something about that show, I think the place was called Club Commotion or something like that. And, or some, or the Chaos Club, I can't remember. But I remember all of us, we found this like white and black paint. We painted our faces like clowns. And Mike only painted one side of his face like a clown. And there's something about that process of like doing something together like that, we, where all of a sudden, like that night, it clicked. At the time, I was like, you know, John was like this anchor for us. And at this point, we had no anchor, like with Trey. It was just like three class clowns going crazy together. So that was sort of the new thing. It's like we're, you know, we're, we're a ship without an anchor. So let's, let's sail the high seas together, you know. Songs like Welcome to Paradise and 2,000 Light Years Away, we didn't know they were going on that record until we recorded them. The one memory that I have is playing England. And I remember, I remember it was, I, it was weird to feel, I was like 19 years old and we we're putting out our second album and feeling like, already feeling like that pressure to, you know, to feel like, is this as good as the last thing that we've done? And then when I got home, we played our homecoming show at Gilman and people knew the lyrics, people already knew it. So, and I was like, oh, you know, oh fuck, this is great. So we started booking a, the next US tour after that. I look at the, a lot of my, the stuff that I listen to, whether it was the Ramones, Operation Ivy, the replacements, I felt like I was listening to something the rest of the world was missing out on. But then it seemed like the world started kind of coming around to, um, it's, it was like, I never felt like we went to the world, the world came to us because it was just this sh kind of cultural shift that we, we happened to be at the right, right time of or something. I thought that maybe we could um, break through and maybe we would <laughs> get big. But I, I always, I'm, I'm, I was very nervous about when we decided to go on to a major label and went on to Warner Brothers. I remember going to see Lollapalooza and, with a friend. And I remember looking up and I think it was like the, the Chili Peppers were headlining and it was Ministry, um, Ice Cube, uh, Lush, Soundgarden. And 
Pearl Jam. And I remember, and that was like 92. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I feel like we're as, you know, as good as these guys. It, it was hard because at that point, punk, the way that we played it was proven that you couldn't get, you know, famous from it. We saw of our heroes try, you know, as far as like Husker and and um, the replacements and um, some others. And it would, you know, it became like a college rock sort of level or the biggest bands out there at the time, like Fugazi and Bad Religion as far as punk rock. And that's sort of like, that's what we thought that we would be almost like the Amish or something where we would, <laughs> you know, we would have, uh, we would play in this sort of scene of people and everything be on a DIY level. But then when you start to, to look at on what was going on the other side, where it was like, you know, Nirvana was getting really big. And then there was like, when I really, like, I love Nirvana, but some of the imitators that came after where I was like, man, these guys suck. Like I, it's like, I know, I know, I feel like we're at least better than these guys. So, um, and that's what was like making us go. We we weren't like, wouldn't it be great to be able to play the the Fillmore or the Warfield or or something like that? And I think with at the label that we were at, we we sort of lost confidence that we could bring it to another level. So, you know, we were started thinking about like, well, what label could we get on? And and I think even like Epitaph hit us up to to be on and. I remember just thinking, if we're gonna do this, let's just let's just roll the dice and 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 see what happens. It's it's there's an opportunity right now to see if like we can kind of break out and we might as well see what we're made of. There was a guy that came to our show, this guy Dave, and he was he was a uh, part of a management office paralegal place and came to our show. We played it at the Berkeley Square, and he said. Um, he goes, hey, if you guys are looking to get on a label, let me know. And he gave us a card. And so we're, I think we sat and we had this card and we, I think we, the three of us stared at it for like two weeks straight or something. <laughs> it was just like this thing. It was like kind of felt like it was like on fire, you know. And so that's when we we met up with these these guys and um, and then we we made a four song demo and, and then uh, we started getting courted by labels. When we signed to a major label back then, that was sort of like, I think that punk rock invented cancel culture. <laughs> it's like, we were outcasts. We were, you know, we were criminals, you know, like the, the biggest, like, you could call me an asshole. You could call me a, a jerk. You can call me a motherfucker. You can call me all these things. But the worst thing that you could call someone back then was a rock star, like fucking John Bon Jovi or something like that. And it's like, no offense to him, but that was the, sort of the antithesis of where we came from. So for for us, it was um, it was like, it's devastating. Devastating. I still feel it to this day. We get people that would wanted to fight us, you know, literally getting in fist fights with people and uh, being banned from certain clubs, getting like 86 from, from Gilman Street, kind of feeling like a fucking pariah or something within our own social group. It was pretty traumatic because, you know, I'm a pretty, pretty sensitive person. Um, when it comes to my relationships with people and, and some of it I probably made up in my head or, or whatever, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty dark around living around the Bay area at that time. I've been having panic attacks, um, since I was about 10 years old, which I guess kind of coincides with a lot of trauma that was going on in my life at that time. But yeah, I was uh, definitely uh, uh, well-versed on um, anxiety by the time I was uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. I think that panic attacks for me were more, they would happen more 
at night when I was alone. It was it didn't really have anything to do with playing live. That came later <laughs> when the crowds got bigger. So I'd start having these like episodes uh, when I was uh, when I was a kid. Up, up, you know, and you know, I, I feel like the older I've gotten, they've gone away a lot more. But that's you know, thank God for the pharmacy. When I was a kid, you didn't say anything about it to anybody. You didn't want. Uh, I think it was more, it wasn't that you wanted to feel like you're being macho about it or anything. It was more, um, you didn't want anybody to think that you were losing your mind because I don't think back then people really knew um, knew mu as much about mental health as they do now. When I think about the punk scene, where we come from, it's like there was a lot of personality disorders and people that had sort of issues. And I think a lot of people who listen to really aggressive rock music, it's a form of, it's like a therapy for them. Because it's like when you listen to bands, whether it's like Green Day or on the extreme level, like something like Slayer, I think what it does, like that kind of music is almost like soothing for people. And it kind of, it, it, it pushes their dopamine levels and kind of chills you out in a weird way. I wrote these lyrics where I was um, actually on speed. And the lyrics, you know, you think that when you're on speed and you write anything or do anything creative, you think that it's the greatest thing in the world. And then the next day when I saw the lyrics, I was just mortified. And I thought it was just, what the hell am I singing about? So I sort of put the song away for a while and then there was a time period where I was having just really bad panic attacks and um, I thought I was losing my mind. So that's when I was like, well, I might as well, this, I'm going to write a song about it. So and I had the melody. That's what, um, <laughs> welcome to my panic. Uh, the song's called Basket Case. 1994 was just... I don't even know how to describe it. It was like all of a sudden we became like pop stars or something. And then we got booked to play Woodstock. So at the time we had Longview was out, the first single. And then the second single was Basket Case. And then we are playing Woodstock. We we're on stage. And I was like pretty amped to play. And I, like, this is going to be pretty awesome. <laughs> I didn't know what other way to, way to think. It was just kind of this crazy backstage atmosphere. It was like the first time I'd ever played a gigantic rock show. And then I remember feeling like, oh, something's not right. This doesn't feel good. And so people started to throw mud. And then like it started getting in our guitar strings. And then we just started throwing it back. We were all covered in mud. You couldn't tell who was in the band. We were like sliding on our bellies and, and the, the audience was on stage. And then Mike ended up getting tackled onto a monitor. And then I jumped on, the, or he, he got tackled by a security guard, busted his teeth and uh, I think broke his elbow. It was a shit show. I remember we, like getting on top of the security guard and, there was this melee and this brawl that happened, like broke out on stage. And then after we grabbed a couple beers and then we got on the helicopter. And I just remember feeling like, I didn't know if like <laughs> that was like the greatest or worst show I ever played in my life. So, but it was, I think it was both. <laughs> what people saw that night on stage was basically what we would see every weekend at Gilman but it was to 100 to 200 people. But this was to 200,000 people or something. And it was on TV. It was on live satellite TV. And and then like the next day, it felt like everything changed after that. I think it was probably towards the end of the summer of 1994. And looking out into the crowd, it felt like... Um, it felt like we were almost like a boy band. It was really exciting and it was uh, terrifying at the same time because I'm like, 
I don't want to be just a pop band or something like that. Or, you know, you, you always sort of worry about what, uh, you know where you come from, but people don't know where you come from at the same time. So it was, uh, it was re- like I said, it was really exciting, but um, kind of terrifying at the same time. I met Adrienne on our first Green Day tour. So that was in 1990. I met her at a basement show that we played in Dinkytown in Minneapolis. So we kind of became pen pals and just wrote letters back and forth and had this long distance sort of affair back and forth. It was like, is this going to happen? Is this not going to happen? And then I remember I, I convinced her just, just come move out to California because she was, she was either thinking she wanted to move to California, move to New York. So she came to California and her parents did not know me. So she moved to California and basically we got married a month later. And this is right after Basket Case came out. I had this opportunity with this person that knew me from before and we were in love and um, yeah. So it was like, let's, let's tie the knot. So we got married and it was like a kind of a BYOB kind of wedding. My friends were showing up with 40 ounces. It was amazing. It was a uh, sort of this punk wedding. And then uh, we found out the day after the wedding that she was pregnant with Joey. And then I think a few days later, I went back out on tour when I was on Lollapalooza. So yeah, and I got home from tour <laughs> And then uh, Adrienne, she had Joey in February of 95. I was like, well, we should buy a house. <laughs> and, you know, and so we bought a small house in Berkeley and uh, make sure that we had a good car. When I look back on it now, it's nothing felt like real life. So the crazier things got, I sort of made things even more crazy in my life. It was... It is nuts, you know. I became really self-conscious. You can almost see it in our, our live shows from 95, 96. I think I was having a hard time with, I, I didn't know how to kind of step outside of being like, a, a start becoming like a front man or something like that. I think at that time, being regarded as a rock star was kind of like a four letter word or something i i knew in the back of my mind what entertaining people was but i rejected sort of being an entertainer and the music just became harder and faster and and i i was sort of i felt like i needed to sort of hide behind guitars and i would think i was being unfair to myself to feel like it was okay to be a rock star as long as it's like on your terms and it's genuine and it's something that you feels authentically who you are. But I couldn't figure out where ambition and integrity sort of met. I just kind of like sort of became more internal on Nimrod. I think we were sort of experimenting with anything from like kind of swing sounding uh, and maybe a little bit of kind of ragtime and, you know, and more traditional Green Day punk rock and more really aggressive hardcore to acoustic ballads. We were being more ambitious about let's, you know, let's try to cover more territory as far as different sort of moods and of like what our music was turning into and try to evolve more. I wrote Good Riddance and it was sort of a breakup song and um, I didn't think I was going to use it for anything. I just sort of had this song that was uh, just trying to figure out what, you know, at the time it was all, always about me, Mike and Trey, what we're, what we're doing together, not what one individual is doing apart, you know. I remember the first time I ever sang it live I thought people were going to throw bottles at me because the single was going to come out. And so I went right at the end of our set. I remember going backstage. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I, I grabbed a beer and I chugged it. 
And then I went out with my guitar and I played it and it got an amazing response. So I think uh, it just, I think, you know, when it was on Seinfeld uh, season finale and it became sort of this prom and it was like, it was like proms, graduations and funerals and weddings or something like that, the kind of the territory uh, that song I never anticipated it, that song going from like, like playing, you know, dirty punk clubs to suddenly being, you know, quotes for someone's yearbook or something in their, their graduation year. It's really fun to play that song, to play Good Riddance Live because you're able to look at people in the crowd and it's at the end of a really sweaty uh, everybody dancing and going crazy and you get this one last like piece of music where people are really unified and singing along and it's uh, makes me want to go out and play a show right now actually we met Rob Cavallo when he was working as a A&R guy for Warner Brothers and we were being courted by by Warner and we hung out with them and we smoked weed with them. And honestly, it was weird because at the time, we didn't really know who we were going to sign with. It was almost like we were kind of persuaded more towards Warner Brothers. And I don't even really know how we ended up with Rob as our producer. It was sort of just, it all kind of fell into in a line. And he, he did a record by this band, The Muffs, which was great. I, mean, I love that album, the uh, debut Muffs record. If you don't have it, get it. It's just amazing. And so I loved what he did with that record. And so then we got into the, you know, we came to our band rehearsals and he would watch us and we got into the studio with him after that. And sort of was the beginning of like, you know, the great thing about Rob is that he's an amazing guitar player and he can play like any Beatles song, you know, on the guitar or piano. And uh, yeah, we would just have these great conversations about music, whether we were talking about the Beatles or the Clash. I think where I remember listening to London Calling with him once and he just kept talking about how this it has this sense of urgency. And um that always kind of struck a chord with me. Rob was like, he was really a good sort of coach. He was like pushing to make something not commercial. He was pushing to make something great and really kind of spilling your guts. I don't have good conversations with people when they talk about doing something commercial or something that is like Grammy worthy or something like that. It's got to come from the heart. And so when I have those kinds of conversations with people about music, that's when I, I feel like I'm at home or something. And Rob and I were always able to have those kinds of conversations. And so when he said, like, we need to make that record now, it was like, God, we felt, it was like that feeling of like dreaming the dreamer's dream. You know, let's let's make this thing. Like, let's get together and let's, let's make this great piece of art and we'll do it together. I remember we, we were scheduled to play, I think it was Jay Leno. And uh, the night before we were partying and Rob Cavallo called us and was like, hey, um, I want to come over and, and like, like, let's hang out. So Rob came over and I had had conversations with Rob before about like, you know, like we always had that thing, like the dream. It's like everybody wants to make a Sgt. Peppers. Everybody wants to make a Tommy. Everybody wants to make that record that defines, you know, that puts you on the map as being the best ever. And I think we struggled with sort of admitting to our ambition, but I think what, what we needed to overcome was sort of like, who are we now compared to what we were before? Because we're not kids anymore. And how do we acknowledge each other as, as friends and, and uh, our complicated relationship with each other and, and also acknowledge each other as musicians and peers and who we are now. And so I remember Rob coming over and just saying, we've had these conversations about what you guys want to do in the future. And now is the time you should start doing it. And that is to make 
a record that is a monumental sort of moment. That conversation sort of stuck with us. So I think at that time we were like, shit, we're, you know, you know, all three of us were looking at each other. Like we're, you know, God, we're, we're grown ass men now. I think we really wanted to make a record that was like, you know, give us an A or give us an F. We don't, we don't care, but we know we're going to make something that, something that's really special and we're just going to go for it. And that was just sort of percolating in our, our heads. We didn't know what we were going to do. We had no, we had no clue, you know? And uh, so we got into to a studio that was in Oakland that we just rented and were like burning through money and just showing up every single day. Just everybody was just sort of contributing and, and, and writing weird songs and, um, and then I remember that's when 9-11 happened. And I think that that just sort of really changed the picture for us altogether. I remember just kind of coming up with the riff for American Idiot. And I remember writing the song and uh, getting Trey in the studio and we we hashed it out. And um, yeah, I looked over at Mike and Trey after and it was obvious what the song was about. And so I just said, are you guys cool with this? And they said, absolutely. I think a lot of our songs were about making statements in a strange way, whether it's, if you go back to like a song like Welcome to Paradise um, or Longview or Minority, those songs are sort of detached from being internal. It's like you're creating something that's more anthemic. And so I just sort of got into like, let's make anthems and without sort of being like pompous or pretentious, um, like let's approach, like feeling like I was approaching it like an anthem more like where it was like, this is my love song. This is going to be my declaration of independence. After that, I remember we had all, left the studio one day and Mike was the only one in there. And a friend of ours, this this guy, Kenny Butler, as we were leaving, he goes, hey, Mike, write a 30-second song and we'll be back. So Mike wrote this 30-second song and it was like this sort of vaudevillian, like, everyone left the studio, everyone left the studio, everyone left the studio but me. And then um, we were kind of laughing. I was like, oh my God, this sounds like the beginning of a of like a silly rock opera or something. And then so I wrote a 30 second thing after that. And then Trey wrote a 30 second thing after that. And it kept evolving and getting more and more sort of bigger. And, and we were just having a really good time with it. And that song ended up becoming Homecoming. So we had Homecoming and we had American Idiot. And I remember sending it to Rob Cavallo. And then he, he, he called me back and he was like, this is insane. You guys got to keep on doing this rock opera thing. I remember just going, who is the American idiot? And then that's when um, I came up with the uh, Jesus of suburbia. At the time, I think like someone like Eminem who was doing like he was uh, being Slim Shady. I thought that like, man, going, jumping into that kind of character, that's sort of like what I thought about Jesus of Suburbia was like, this is my character. This is like what I'm going to jump out of my own skin. So I was able to kind of get out of my own way a little bit more by kind of jumping into a different character altogether. There's like Jesus of Suburbia and then there's St. Jimmy. St. Jimmy is the toxic, the toxic friend that's going to take you down into like a three-day bender. (laughs) Uh, And then, you know, Jesus of Suburbia is that rabble rouser, the friend that's going to take you into your individuality and, and take you to the place where you can find the things that you believe in. It sounds really pretentious, like when I think about it, but at the time we were, um, 
there's also like a part of it where you're not taking yourself very seriously either because you are creating characters so you feel sort of detached. You're not one or the other. You're all of it. And somewhere in the middle is the real you where there's like wake me up with September ends when you're the kid that was, there's the trauma that sometimes can define you. It's like just trying to figure out who you are in your life, I guess, or the life that you live so far and the, the life that you want to have for yourself in the future and writing songs through that, I guess. The first thing I ever wrote for American Idiot that I felt really good about was I wrote, Wake Me Up When September Ends. And that was a song about my father that I never really thought I was going to go there. And I just was like, I'm just going to go go there because he died in September of 1982. So that song I felt like was sort of a new, like a breakthrough for me. You know, and I just started thinking about how September is just a, a really, it's it's hard for everybody. I think it's, you know, the summer's over. A lot of people are going back to school. Vacation's over. It's sort of the really, like, the beginning of the fall. Everything is changing. It's getting colder out. And I think that's what that song kind of means to me. And, um... Of course, when the terror attack that happened at the World Trade Center was, um, that was the ultimate September tragedy. So that sort of just made the song make even more sense, if not just completely define what the song is about altogether. American Idiot became a Broadway musical, and I was able to go and play St. Jimmy for, for a few months on Broadway the St. James Theater. To be in the musical was, um, it was amazing. It was like way like I came full circle with with the whole, I I can't even describe what the experience was like, but to to be able to get up and play the devil every night um, was, it was really fun. It was also, um, when you're doing that character every single day, you can definitely start to sort of feel like you're you're it's it, it becomes more and more real all, all the time because I think I remember I was just like sleeping in my clothes and not really bathing anymore and just kind of be, becoming that that guy which is you know it's everyone's got a self-destructive side of them uh but like for me I'm pretty vulnerable to self-destruction so, um, but to get out and do it on on stage felt like lightning striking every single night. So I felt like when I did the character, I can bring something that was probably felt pretty real to people in the audience because, well, shit, I wrote it. So after American Idiot, I remember there was that feeling of like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? But I remember like, it's like, like, let's just go back in and just kind of pick up where we left off and start from scratch and, you know, going into 21st century breakdown. And that became really uh, daunting and uh, really stressful, stressful for everybody. And it was making me crazy. I think that we just we were trying to really do something that was diverse and really kind of outdo ourselves in in, um, these arrangements and and where it was was going. It was a hard album to make. One of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, And it was because I set the bar so high and I, uh, and I did it to myself. There There was no, nobody was setting it for me. You know, you feel like you're sometimes you're writing records and and someone's got a gun to your head, but actually I'm the one that was holding the gun. So it was like, uh, yeah, we just were really trying to outdo ourselves more than you know. It's like all of these kind of crazy concepts. And I remember at the time we wanted to make a record that was like had this big animation sort of movie and 
And then it's like you you take your ambition so far and then you got to pull back of like, okay, what, um, okay, where, where are we at with this? It's one of my favorite records for Green Day, for sure. But I have a hard time going back and listening to 21st Century Breakdown because it just reminds me of like all of the, the hard work that went into it. Music became unfun for me at that time because I felt like I was putting so much pressure on myself. I mean, you to make, so like when we did Uno Dos Tre, I mean, it's a triple album, you know, which is absurd. So it was like, there was not a lot of self-care going on, if, if any at all. And at the time, like my panic attacks were going up, 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 up and turning into just like rage attacks. And I was, um, so I started getting really addicted to like uh, Xanax and Klonopin and um, this stuff, this like, in, and I was mixing it with alcohol um, and uh, and trying to stay away from alcohol at the same time. And I was just really mixed up and uh, and I was just, fucked up um just on pharmaceuticals and and uh booze and so i remember the last thing i remember was trying to you know i heart radio i was trying to come up with a set list and I, I was at a block i couldn't come up with 15 minutes of of a set list i was just completely like what am i doing i i couldn't nobody and Nobody could help. I didn't want anybody to help. I didn't want, and and I was just going out of my mind. And I I think it was just the culmination of like working that hard for so many years, uh, and and feeling like I had to keep writing, 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 and uh, losing kind of sight of just trying to take better care of myself, and then. So in the iHeartRadio thing, I remember trying to come up with that set list and then I went to the bar and I just started drinking. And then next thing I know, I was talking to someone at, a, at the bar and then my mind was a blank after that. I was just blackout drunk, which would happen to me on a pretty normal, regular basis. I would, I would black out um, pretty frequently. But that was because there was all the pharmaceuticals I was in like – bubbling in my brain that was just causing just slamming the door shut so it happened and I think like I don't regret it you know like it just was something that was kind of like um I'm not embarrassed by it um I don't feel really ashamed of myself I think I was just getting into a place where it was just getting scary. And if it kept going, I'd end up fucking dead. So that's where I, I was like, okay, I, I need to evaluate life and kind of like make sure that I'm on the earth as long as humanly possible. I went into rehab right after that. And, um, and it was like, I just needed to get my shit together. I had to get sober and um, and I think it was just like my kids were, saw that meltdown and that was really uh, disturbing for me and I felt terrible about it. So I just had to kind of work on me and my family and sobriety. And when I think back about it, it's like, it's a, it's a, you know, it's kind of like Woodstock part two for us or something. So it was like, uh, it was really toxic. When you cross the line and, and all you're doing is trying to look for pleasure because you're in pain all the time, that's when you're a danger to yourself. A lot of people don't understand what it's like to be in your head writing lyrics 24 hours a day it can fuck your head up because it's like you're looking at yourself from every single angle. And when you're blocked or anything, you feel like your brain is blocked. So it's like you're, you're writing 
and it's uh and then sometimes you don't know what you're writing about and then sometimes you don't know who you are and it's you're it's a really it can be a very dangerous place to be in because you um you're you like oh god i want to give up on this song you feel and sometimes that feels like you're giving up on yourself you have to learn how to find different things in your life to figure out to to take you away from it whether it's family or learning how to do some kind of you know you can rebuild a car or you can go surfing or you can uh um you know uh you know i think like neil young is really into trains and and things like that if you don't if you don't distract yourself somehow you get stuck in that sort of frame of mind and um and it gets like can get pretty scary there's times when I've looked at certain things that I've done and it's taken my breath away where I can't believe that I survived. I was like basically standing at the edge of the earth and ready to jump off. It's years of the accumulation of being vulnerable as being a, a songwriter or an artist or, or doing something and either people love what you do or they hate what you do or you love what you do or you hate what you do, you know, it's like, it stirs a lot of emotions. Getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I felt like uh, it wasn't just Green Day getting inducted. I felt like it was sort of our whole scene that we come from in the East Bay and our hometown in Oakland and Gilman Street. It was sort of like... I felt like it was a recognition of that scene, you know, other people's stories tell your story in a lot of ways. So it was important for the scene to get acknowledged along with us. Like it was a scene that supported us and gave us a place to play like at Gilman Street and where it's like bands like Operation Ivy or Crimp Shrine or the bands that we played with the the people like Tim Yohannan that was running Gilman and the people that, uh, you know, for better or worse, it, the good stories and the bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We just wanted to bring the whole extended family with us, just sort of like the whole collective. We brought our friends, people that we played with, it was Aaron Comet Bus and um, Tim Armstrong from Rancid and, we brought John Kiffmeyer back. Um, I got in touch with John because I thought his contribution was, you know, really important. What he did on the first EPs and what he did on um, the first album. So it was great. It was just like a big, big sort of family and scene reunion atmosphere. And you know, I mean, to look out into the crowd and just see, you know, anyone from, you know. Uh, Patty Smith to uh, uh, Joan Jett. It was kind of like looking at your your record collection that you uh, you were brought up on, you know. And then and then to, and and Ringo Starr, you know, which was like, you know, just sit there and and listen to Paul McCartney uh, standing next to his amp while he was uh, remembering how to play the bass line to with a little help from my friends. It was uh, like surreal, just, um, you know, how, um, how important that was to us and how much it meant to us. When people write about how they are older and wiser, I go, God, that sounds so boring. Wisdom is so overrated. <laughs> I love writing from a perspective of my younger self. It's just honest emotion. It goes back to the songs that I wrote about girls and lost love and, and things like that. You have to be in that place of, um, gosh, almost naivete. That's what being young feels like. I think people cheer for Green Day as far as like, being able to wear your heart on your sleeve and just be honest about your experience as a human being. My name is Billy Joe Armstrong, and these are my words and music. An audible original.
Billy Joe Armstrong. Words and Music was produced for Audible by Gumpowder and Sky. Executive produced by Van Toffler. Narrated and performed by Billy Joe Armstrong. Produced by Alex Coletti and Bill Flanagan. Co-produced by Jillian Appleby. Line produced by Allison Reutinger. Supervising producer, Barry Barclay. Show mixed by Christopher Cook. Music mixed by Chris Dugan. Business and legal affairs by Luke Marchetti. Rights and clearances by Abby Kendi. Production finance by Jacqueline Soletsky. For Audible, executive producer, Preston Copley. Music content supervisor, Jeff Dudzik. Content acquisition and development, Peter Myshide. Creative development and production, Brittany McCombs and Carson Donnelly. Production counsel, John Curland. Special thanks to Billy Joe Armstrong, Scott Nagelberg, Jonathan Daniel, Jenna Hudson, Allison Weber, Carrie Disney, Alexis Jalad, Samantha Alicia, Michelle Postel, and Elliot Wilson. Copyright 2021 Salsina LLC. Sound recording copyright 2021 by Audible Originals LLC.